officially declared war on worry. We are envisioning a day in which anxiety is a thing of the past, in which we come out of the valley of fret and live more days marked by peace and diminishing panic. So grateful that you could be a part of this service today, whether you're watching online, many of you in the overflow rooms, and the rest of you right here in the auditorium are so grateful that you could be with us. The Apostle Paul has given us a prescription for anxiety, and in just a moment, we're going to read it together. In fact, on this, the last installment of the series, I'm going to ask us to all, in just a moment, to stand up and read it together out of respect for the Lord's Word. But before we read that passage, let me thank you for this honor that is mine as we bring the last message of the series to you. Actually, this is the last weekend of my preaching season uh, at Oak Hills for this calendar year. Uh, we've done three series together, starting with Traveling Light in January and then 100 Happy People and now, spring and summer, we've been finding a way to battle anxiety. Sometimes I think God is partial to me. I really do. I, I think it's almost unfair how kind he is to me. I not only get to preach, but I get to preach at the greatest church in the history of humanity, <laughs> uh, the Oak Hills Church. And you guys are, are just... You're spectacular, and I can't tell you how excited I am every weekend to have this privilege. I'm very excited about what Randy's going to lead us into for the remainder of the year, and I want you to know that as I now enter into a time of, of travel, wherever I am, whatever city I'm in, whatever coast I'm on, I'll be thinking of you. You'll be on my mind and in my heart, and so I deeply, deeply love you and appreciate you. Now, one final time, let's recite the God's antidote for anxiety. But this time, let's all stand up. Fill your lungs with air. Fill your hearts with hope. Say it like you mean it. Put your shoulders back. Put a smile on your face. The words will appear on the screen. Many of you don't need them, though. though you've memorized the passage. But if you need them, here they are. Let's say it together. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue in anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Way to go. Thank you, Lord, again for this beautiful scripture. Please grant that we might receive it. Forgive our speaker. His sins are too many to count. Help us to see Jesus, just Jesus. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. Good job. Please be seated. It's 2.30 a.m. and you cannot sleep. You pound your pillow. You adjust your blankets. You flip first to this side and then the next. Nothing helps. You really need to get to sleep. Everyone else is asleep. Your spouse snores like a grizzly in hibernation. <laughs> Not a peep from the kids' room down the hallway. Even the dog is curled up in a lump at the foot of the bed. Everybody else is asleep, everyone that is except you, and you really need to sleep because in six hours, you're starting a new job. You'll be at a new office, a new chapter. You'll be entering a new world. You'll be the rookie on the sales team. And you're wondering if you made the right decision. You've been told that the boss is demanding. You know the economy is declining. The competition is increasing. Besides, you're 23 years old, right out of college. This is your first job. You're 33 years old with two kids to feed and a family to care for. You're 43 years old, the latest victim of layoffs and downsizing. You're 53 years old, not the ideal age to change careers. You're 63 years old. What happened to retirement plans? 
and seeing grandkids. Here you are starting over. Here you are wide awake. No matter the age, the transition comes. The questions fall like hailstones. Will I make enough money? Will I make any friends? Will I have a cubicle? Will I be able to learn the software program? Will I learn the sales pitch? Will I be able to find the bathroom? You can't go to sleep. You feel a twitch in the back of your neck. That twitch welcomes a whole new strain of worry. Do I have cancer? Is that a tumor? Granddad had a tumor. He had chemo for a year. Oh, no. New job and chemo? How will I be able to... Oh, man. Will the insurance cover this? Is this a pre-existing condition? What am I going to do? The thoughts rage through your mind like a tornado in Texas. And they suck off to the sky any last vestige of peace. <sighs> Another hour passes. 2.30 becomes 3.30. And the green letters on the clock are the only light in your room. Indeed, the only light in your world. You cover your head with a pillow. You feel like crying. What does all this mean? All this trepidation. All this unsettledness. All this anxiety. All this restlessness. All this insomnia. What does this mean? Can I tell you what this means? It means you're a person. It means you're a human. It means you're born into a difficult world on a changing planet. It doesn't mean that you're emotionally underdeveloped. It doesn't mean that you're mentally ill. It doesn't mean that you're a wimp or a sissy. It doesn't mean that you made a wrong decision. It doesn't mean that you're a failure. It doesn't mean that you don't have any faith. It doesn't mean that you're a jerk. It doesn't mean that you're demon-possessed. It doesn't mean that your parents failed you, and it doesn't mean that you failed your parents. And it doesn't mean that you're destined to spend a life in this cycle of anxiety. It doesn't mean that you're going to worry the rest of your days like your granddad did or your mom did. This isn't passed down from generation to generation. And this is important. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Christians battle anxiety. Jesus felt anxiety for heaven's sake. In the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before his crucifixion, three times he prayed, take this cup from me. Prayed with such intensity that he pounded the ground and his heart pounded blood into his system with such ferocity that the capillaries burst and rivulets of crimson came down his face. He felt anxious. But he didn't stay anxious. He entrusted his fears to his heavenly father. And that is what he is teaching us to do. Anxiety comes with life, yes. But it just doesn't have to dominate our lives. The presence of anxiety is optional. Is, is, is unavoidable. But the prison of anxiety, now that's optional. God has given us a recipe, a prescription, tucked away in a small four-chapter epistle called Philippians, written by the Apostle Paul. And it's like a prescription for anxiety. And as we wrap this series up and back away and look at the passage from one viewpoint instead of phrase by phrase, it dawns on us that this passage follows a real practical sequence, almost like four steps are tucked away in these verses. Step one, rejoice in the Lord. Step two, ask the Lord. Step three, leave your problem with the Lord. And step four, meditate on what is good. Step one, step two, step three, step four. We rejoice. We make a request. 
We rely on the Lord. And then we rehearse with positive thoughts what he has done. Step one, step two, step three, step four. This has the feel to me of what consultants call a decision tree. Maybe you've seen a decision tree. When you have a question, you can Google decision tree and you'll see a graph. It looks kind of like an ancestry tree. And you start with your question, and then option one is this answer. Option two is this answer. If you go option one, that will lead you here. Option two will lead you there. Well, the apostle has given us a decision tree to use on those 2.30 a.m. moments when we cannot get to sleep. He helps us learn how to think through with God's help. trees, then this passage is for you. Here's how it works. You begin with a question that's at the top of the handout. What, what's got you anxious? What's got you anxious? Each and every one of you, I imagine, could answer that question right now. Something's got you anxious. And your temptation, all of our temptations and tendencies, is to focus on that problem. To analyze that problem, to think about that problem. But that's a mistake. The first step is not to analyze the problem, but to shift our eyes to our Heavenly Father. The more we look at our problem, the bigger the problem gets. That, destruct, that is a destructive thought pattern. Here's a better idea. Turn your eyes away from the problem, and for just a few moments, celebrate God. That's what the apostle says. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Now, this may surprise you that the quickest way to deal with your problem is not to focus on your problem, but to fo focus first on your heavenly Father. You see, the more you stare at your problem, the more you meditate on the problem, the more it tends to grow. But the more you think about your heavenly Father, the more the problem shrinks down to size. This is what the psalmist did. Remember this passage in Psalm 121 and verse 1? I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Do you see the intentionality? I will lift up my eyes. The default gaze was on the problems. So he had to say, okay, I'm going to lift up my eyes. I will look to the one who gives me help. He made the heavens and the earth. I'm going to celebrate him. So you refuse to stare at the predicament. Choose not to meditate on the mess. You gain nothing by setting your eyes on the problem. You gain everything by setting your eyes on the Lord. This was the lesson the apostle Peter learned on the stormy sea of Galilee. Remember the night that the storm came in and the waves got to be as high as 10 feet tall. He knew that fishing boat could not survive those windy waves. So 
He was the first one to invite, to ask Jesus if he could get out of the boat. When he saw Jesus walking on the water through the storm toward them, Peter cried out, Lord, if it is really you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And Peter left the boat and walked on the water to Jesus. But when Peter saw the wind and the waves, he became afraid. And he began to sink. And he shouted, Lord, save me. As long as Peter's eyes were focused on the face of his Savior, he could do the impossible. But when did he begin to sink? When his eyes shifted from the face of the Savior to the force of the storm. If you feel yourself beginning to sink, turn your gaze back onto your Father in heaven. Rejoice in the Lord always. If you're sinking, it's because you're not looking at the Father. So self-correct. Lift up your eyes. Look to the hills from whence comes your help. Look to Jesus, keep your eyes on him, and you'll find your strength coming back. This is the message of Paul. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say to you, rejoice. As if one time wasn't enough, he had to tell us twice. Now just rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say to you, rejoice. Celebrate what God has done. In the book of Philippians, as we pointed out in the series, the apostle celebrates two attributes of God. God's sovereignty and his mercy. So you ask yourself the question, is God sovereign over this circumstance? Whatever it is, is he sovereign over this circumstance? And the answer is yes, because he's sovereign over everything. Maybe your anxiety comes not from a mishap, but from a misstep. And so you ask the question, is God's grace great enough to cover this sin? And the answer is always yes. So you celebrate who God is. You rejoice in the Lord. And having done that, then you move to step number two. You ask God for help. You ask him for help. Let your requests be made known to God. Remember, fear triggers either despair or prayer. Fear always triggers either despair or prayer. Choose wisely. God said, call on me in the day of trouble. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Both God and then Jesus, God on earth, invites you. They say, whenever you speak, we will listen. So met, let your requests be made known to God. You celebrated who God is. Now you ask him for help. Ask specifically and ask because of the promises of God. Let your requests be specific. Just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane, he said, take this cup from me. Very simple prayer. Jesus' mother came to him at the wedding that had run out of wine. She said, they have no more wine. The prayer doesn't have to be long, doesn't have to be poetic or elaborate. You state what you need. Here is my request. And then you stand on a promise. But you said you would hear me. You said you would walk me through this. You remind God of what he has said, not because he forgets, but because we tend to forget. So you stand before God based on his promises. The Hebrew writer said, let us approach the throne of grace with what? With confidence, not with timidity, nor with a swagger, but just with confidence. We're confident that he will hear us. Having done this, then you can leave it with God. You have rejoiced, you have celebrated, you have asked for help. Now you can leave it with God, and God will do his part. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So you let God take charge. You let him do what he's so willing to do, and that is guard your heart and your mind, the two seats, the seat of intellect and the seat of emotion. So you let him guard those, and his peace will stand around you like a sentinel protecting you. Paul the apostle said, 
The one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. So you have this problem. You have rejoiced in God's ability to solve it. You take it to him. You ask specifically for help. And then you leave it with him. This may be the most difficult step. Because we leave it with him. We get halfway out the door. And then we come back and we want to fix it. It's very hard, isn't it? To, how many of you are somewhere between an offered prayer and an answered prayer? It's hard to leave it, isn't it, with him. Have you ever taken an appliance into a store to be fixed or a computer or laptop to be fixed at the computer store or, or a lawnmower? Have you ever had something break and had to take it to somebody to fix it? How does that procedure, what's the protocol on that? Well, you identify that something's broken. You take it to the person who can fix it. You offer your request. You tell them what has happened. And then what do you do? Well, you throw out a sleeping bag and you stay right there with him. And you wait until he gets... No? You follow him around. You hover behind him, giving him suggestions. No? You wait for him at every turn. You show him he's on the clock. He better hurry. Come on, come on, come on. No? What do you do? You leave it with him. With the promise, he will let you know when he is finished. Leave your problem with God. Leave it. And whenever that emotion of anxiety surfaces, here's what you say. Oh, I left that with God. That's in good hands. Would you please repeat after me? I hereby resign... As ruler of the universe. <laughs> Congratulations. Isn't that a load? You are no longer in charge of the world. And you have taken that problem. And I really do not mean to diminish your problems. I know they're hard. I know some of them are heavy. But God is strong. And he is mighty. And you do nothing for yourself by trying to solve it on your own. You take it and you leave it with him. Then you have all of this brain matter available, all of this brain cell capacity that has been going toward anxiety needs to be used for something, right? So what does the apostle say? Well, now that all of this brain capacity is freed up, why don't you use that brain to meditate on something else? Rather than meditate on the problem, turn your attention to what is good. Meditate on good things. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, you just meditate on these things. And rather than let your mind be consumed with anxiety, since you have been told by your preacher to be a picky thinker, and you get to think what you think about, to be careful what you think about, and to mind your mind, now you're going to carefully guard your thoughts. Do what my good friend Karen Hill did. Ten years ago this weekend, my longtime assistant and dear friend Karen Hill was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. And the news knocked the wind out of her. She writes, I knew that I could not fight well if I fought out of fear. As I prayed, God reminded me that his word is intended to be a true guide for living, even in difficult seasons. This passage in Philippians is intended for just such times, and it became my constant friend. I prepared a simple card that I could carry to doctor's appointments, chemo, tests, and hospital stays. And whenever I sensed these unwelcome thoughts returning, I would review my card, making a mental list of everything I knew to be true, noble, lovely, and so forth. By the time I reached the end of the list, the Lord had brought peace back into my spirit. One little card, a rich reminder that God is not the author of fear or pain, but rather the soother and comforter of my soul. Karen didn't use the word, but she could have. She climbed up in a tranquilla tree, and she left behind the orchard of anxieties. 
I hope you'll do the same. I know this is not an easy battle. I know that. And I know that for some of you, this is the battle of life. It's a challenge every day. And do not think for a second that I think by reducing a sermon series into a card or giving you some clever little slogans that I think that this can be resolved always without any help. For some of you, God's healing will include the help of therapy and or medication. For some of you, your anxiety is not situational, it's just chronic. And if that's the case, don't think for a moment you're a second-class citizen of heaven if you turn to a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a physician or to medication to help you. God can use any tool to help you, and he will help you. You just trust him and trust and believe that he is speaking to you when he says that all of these things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I'll leave you with this thought, that God is really on your side in this. He's not at a distance with his arms crossed saying, I wish that they would get their act together. He's on your side, pulling for you, in your corner, cheering for you. I have a good friend by the name of Bill Fry, a man for whom I have great respect, served for many years at the Episcopalian Diocese here in South Texas. When he was 11 years old, he tells this story in one of his books called Dance of Hope. When he was 11 years old, he was roaming about the farmland where he was raised in Georgia looking for stumps because his job was to pull stumps out of the ground and cut the stump up to be used for firewood. He found one large stump of a pine tree and he began trying to unearth it, but it was so deeply rooted in the ground, he couldn't get it to budge. He was only 11 years old anyway, but still he worked, pushing and pulling and pushing and pulling. Presently, his father appeared, and his father watched, didn't say anything for a while. And after a few moments, Bill's dad said, I think I know your problem. Bill said, what? He said, you're not using all your strength. Well, Bill took offense at that. He said, I've been working all day and I've been working very hard. And the father says, but you're not using all your strength. And Bill said, what? And Bill's dad said, you haven't asked me to help you. Ask your father to help you. For many of you, anxiety is like wrestling stumps out of the ground. And the deep, root system of your long embedded worries won't come out overnight but it will with God's help it will come out he has given us these promises in time you're going to discover peace that you never knew existed on one occasion, God sent the ancient prophet Isaiah to comfort a king, King Ahaz. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 2, it says that the people of Ahaz shook with fear like trees of the forest blown by the wind. It sounds to me like they're in a grove of anxiety trees. But God gave this word to Isaiah. He said, tell the king, be careful be calm and don't worry. That's what God is saying to you. Just be careful. Guard your thoughts. Be calm. Celebrate God. Ask God for help. Leave your problems with him and meditate on good things. C-A-L-M. Be calm and don't worry. Amen. So, Lord, this is our prayer that you would help us to do just this. We celebrate you, your sovereign plan. We ask you for help. We give our concerns to you. We leave them with you. And we turn our attention to meditate on what you want us to meditate on. This is our prayer through Christ. And all the church said, Amen. Amen.